Now we turn to chapter 1 of Greg Gilbert's What is the Gospel? He opens the chapter with a beautiful illustration of using, and the book is quite old actually, but still applicable, of using the analogy of a GPS and how modern technology can fail humans and depending on what it's based on. Uh, recently I remember uh, the same fact of using Google and uh, coming out of India where Modi used to say that you cannot trust Google and uh, trying to uh, get to uh, the graduation ceremony that Abraham was hosting uh, as MC and following Google and it taking me uh, down a road that uh, was very difficult because it was under construction. And uh, often Google leads me uh, through places that um, are very difficult and it gets very hard and makes mistakes. So uh, Gilbert is asking then what is our source of authority? And he turns to what is commonly known as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral quadrilateral, where we have various things when we're trying to analyze truth. Um, this slide here it represents a, a good quote from John Wesley, try all things by the written word and let all bow down before it. You are in danger every hour if you depart ever so little from scripture. So I wanted you to see that Wesley believed similarly to what Gilbert says and there is truth out there now uh, within the confines of truth is scripture as we see that scripture is entirely encompassed about by this truth but then not all truth is in the Bible there are many things that we learn from science that's uh, different than what the Bible is trying to express, the way the scripture uh, describes our world is uh, cosmologically as a flat disk, is not how science has led us to understand. So many people have made mistakes thinking that all truth is inside the scripture. But there are many things you will not learn uh, all the dimensions of mathematics including 2 plus 2 equals 4 from the Bible. So, um, there's many things in science that we've learned that's not contained in the scriptures. And so, scripture is the revealed truth that God was speaking to his people in a special context through human authors um, who, as humans, fail. He used to be uh, a part of a church denomination uh, whereby they said that we know that the scripture is true it's just that when humans uh, get a hold of the scripture then that truth can change because humans fail and it's it's almost similar to what I talked to a Muslim about um, his understanding of the Quran was a bit different than what Wesley's trying to say here or that denomination. He understands that the Quran, yes, has some errors in it, but the Quran has, is all truth. And so if he takes the entire Quran within himself, he gets all of the truth. And although there may be errors and problems with the Quran, by taking all of the Quran, he still gets all the truth that God wants him to have. And uh, outside the Quran, that's not possible. So that was his take. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the five syllabus. I am not. Uh, so we can discuss this. But the idea of sola scripture, I believe, is what Gilbert is wanting to argue. And I have a question. The church has argued, what about the dangers of private interpretation? Because you can read the scripture one way, 
and I can read it another. And the whole reason we're here is because Gilbert reads the scripture and understands the gospel in one way, and Bates and McKnight another way. So who's right? So it's easy to say sola scriptura, and of course Wesley has said that we cannot depart from scripture. But then what is scripture? And Gilbert turns famously to 2 Timothy 3.16. Okay. So no surprise, we're all familiar with these verses. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. And what's interesting here is when this was written, what was scripture? Okay, now I'm not going to go again. There's no need to go to the Greek word behind the word scripture, although we could and do word study as we did with you and Gillian and you and Gilead. So, and as Heiser's done with Elohim, we could do that. We could go through all these Greek words here and do all kinds of things. So, the question though is, what is scripture? And how do you understand that and how do they understand that? Now, again, I don't need to get into all the scholastic debate on whether 2 Timothy is written by Paul or not. Whether this is by the hand or by one of Paul's associates or, you know, is a Deuteropauline and all those arguments. Okay. Let's just, for the sake of today's discussion, let's just take this to mean that this is written by Paul, whether through his secretary or however. Let's not concern ourselves with the details. Let's not get lost in scholarship. But let's just think for a minute logically. All scripture. If we go back to our understanding of the canon, okay, how the Bible came to be, and again, we have different canons. If you go to different traditions within Christianity, there are different canons. The Roman Catholic Church has their canon, and they have extra books in what we call the Old Testament that are deutero canonical okay and they place those in their old testament we uh, as protestants typically take uh, the jewish canon and what the jews accepted so a brief discussion on canonicity um, is that in the new testament the new testament writers over 60 percent of the time use something called the Greek translation of the Old Testament, often called simply the Septuagint. Okay? I don't want to get too far afield in here, but I think this is important. And so if it was understood that the Christian Bible coming out of the first century was this Greek translation of the Old Testament and the oldest and best uh, manuscripts that we have of the New Testament based upon scholarship most generally today uh, include this Greek translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament as we have it today. Now there's some divergence in these areas. But the main idea is that why some traditions within Christianity except these other books of the Old Testament is because again 60% of the time they're using the Greek Bible the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, so it became known as the Christian's Bible coming out of the first century okay and then the Hebrews coming out of the first century uh, the Masoretes tradition produced their own version of the Old Testament in opposition. And so we understand in biblical studies that there are 
two different texts of the Old Testament, and possibly more with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that underlie the Old Testament. But the Masoretes uh, developed a system of text, and then about a thousand years ago, the Masoretes decided that one text shall rule them all, and they decided to choose uh, what they felt like was the best text for the Hebrew Bible and made that choice and which books would be included and in what order they would be included. And we have that in that document. We have documents of that. Not perfect. Some have been damaged like the Pentateuch, uh, largely damaged. Um, and, and by fire or these documents again because of weather and time get destroyed but we have those documents and so the Protestants about 500 years ago when they split from the Roman Catholic Church um, decided to follow the Masoretic tradition of the Old Testament and chose those books okay but the other traditions, like the Roman Catholic Church, among others, Eastern Orthodox, um, kept the Christian's Bible because they felt like this is what the Christians used. And the Protestants decided that because these books um, are deuterocanonical, uh, um, they hold a secondary status. They're never quoted necessarily in the New Testament. Um, and so there was debate, and they went with the Masoretic Hebrew Bible, giving deference, uh, respect, that if this is uh, the Jews' Bible, then they would know best which books belong in there. But again, when you compare the Old Testament text and the Masoretic tradition, we know that, uh, that the Old Greek was using a different in a lot of places, was using a different uh, underlying text for their translation to produce from the Hebrew to the Greek because at that time, by the first century, and they began this work around 250 years before Christ, um, but anyway, uh, by that time, most of their adherents were Greek-speaking as their primary language, much like English is the language of the world today, and we're using the ESV, as you can see, in this presentation. And so, it was a translation, as the ESV is a translation, and we're not using the original Greek. And so, um, they translated it into the language that everybody was familiar with. And so, that was the primary one used. And then with the discovery in 1947 of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found instances and evidence of text that there are other traditions behind the Old Testament other than the Masoretic text. And even other than the Septuagint, we have the Targums, which are uh, paraphrases in Aramaic of the Old Testament that also have things that are different. They're not exact translations. They're more paraphrases. Uh, but they do help us. And we have other traditions like the Samaritans and they have their Pentateuch and so we have all these different ways of looking at the Hebrew Bible so that we know as scholars that the Hebrew Bible is not what the Masoretes give us uh, exactly but that obviously throughout the centuries there have been some divergence in the way that the word came down to us nothing major uh, so it's it's not major but it causes translators to make different decisions. As we all know, you can uh, check out, again, Heiser, the Unseen Realm, and what he does with Deuteronomy chapter 32, specifically verse 8, how the ESV gets verse 8 dead on. You can look at his discussions of verse 17, how the ESV gets it wrong, and you can get back to, again, verse 43 where the ESV again gets it right in his opinion now he's proven himself academically in over 10 Semitic ancient languages related to the Bible so he is an authority 
and, and different authorities disagree with him. But this is an example. So, when the person, and we're going to say for uh, simple discussion's sake, uh, wrote 2 Timothy 3, all scripture. At that time, there is no New Testament. So logically thinking, we understand that all scripture here would mean the Old Testament. Now, Protestants and Jews coming out of the first century have concluded what that is. Okay, what that is. And they have concluded that that is what Protestants call the 39 books of the Old Testament. But if you go to the Masoretic tradition, it varies. And along the lines, and one of the most common is that it lines up to about 22, 23, 24, depending on how you do it, um, books. Okay. Now, the 39 that the Protestant Bible has of the Old Testament and the 22 or so that the Hebrew Bible has are the same, except some books in the Hebrew Bible are joined together. For instance, what Protestants call the Minor Prophets is one scroll called the Book of the, the, Book of the Twelve because it's the Twelve Smaller Prophets, smaller in size but not in significance. And so those Twelve Books of the Minor Prophets, the Book of the Twelve, the Scroll of the Twelve, the Twelve, become one in the Hebrew Bible, and so that's how you can get from 39 down to 22, because they join certain books together. And another interesting approach is that the ordering is different in the Hebrew Bible, according to the Masoretic text. Uh, obviously, the Pentateuch, uh, we stay the same all the way from, you know, Genesis to Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges, and that order does not change much. But we do have changes in order in such as where the book of Ruth goes. In the Protestant Bible, Ruth follows the book of Judges, and then we have Ruth in the latter part, the end of the Masoretic text, and Ruth is placed way down at the end. And if you do careful studies in the book of Ruth, those who take a canonical approach to Ruth, um, they're understanding of what Ruth could mean in context is different based on the ordering of the books in the Protestant canon where Ruth comes after Judges early in the Old Testament and in the Hebrew Bible where Ruth comes quite late you can have a different interpretation or a different way of understanding the book of Ruth um, as applied to where it fits in the Masoretic uh, context of being later towards the end of their Bible. All this to say that if all scripture, and he's only talking about the Old Testament, and again, I told you in a previous video, one of my students asked me, can you prove that Jesus is God without using the Gospel of John? Because we know that John, particularly his Gospel, the writings, is where we have um, some of the greatest statements about the divinity of Jesus. And so, if John is not available, then it should be harder for one to prove that Jesus is God. And there's a whole discussion within um, the historical Jesus and apologetics on whether or not Christians believe that Jesus is God in the sense that we believe. And that brings up the whole idea of how the church struggle with the idea of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in our Bibles. Nowhere. From Genesis to Revelation, you will not find the word Trinity in the Bible. Now, interestingly, you will find the word rapture, or in the Latin, in the Latin Bible, rapturo, several times. So, maybe you don't believe in the rapture, but that word, rapturo, at least in the Latin, appears in the Bible in a couple of places. But, and you may not hold to the view of the rapture, but in the Latin Bible, rapturo does appear in our Bible in a couple of places, at least. But then the word trinity does not. So this is uh, what I wanted to bring out, 
that um, if we're talking about the Old Testament um, and they use 60, over 60% of the time they use the Greek Old Testament commonly referred to the Septuagint then some traditions accepted the same books that were included when the translation was uh, passed on it took it took almost three centuries to complete um, so it was completed sometime uh, we believe in around the first century but if this is the Bible that the Christians were using, then why not include these books in the Old Testament? And so we have here two excellent arguments on what is Scripture. So if we go back then to the Wesleyan quadrilateral, sola scriptura, what is Scripture? It took centuries for the church, and it was not until around the fourth century or so and again you can do and maybe I should do a video to describe all these things to make it simpler for people to understand but it took centuries for the church to decide and I love what uh, David Burnett um, a good scholar who's doing his PhD now out of Marquette in Wisconsin I love what he says Scripture basically is tradition. The tradition of our forefathers that was passed down to us is Scripture. But it took the church nearly four centuries to discuss what actually is Scripture and to decide. For instance, Tertullian, an early church father, in the early part of that debate, was so enthralled with the book of First Enoch and its specific connections in Jude and even in Second Peter, among others, in the New Testament, and its explanatory power for Genesis chapter 6, of which you should be familiar with when you read Heiser's Unseen Realm. And if you want to continue those discussions, he has more information in his next book called Reversing Hermon, and he has appendices into uh, First Enoch, and now he even has a reading commentary where he helps you, uh, a reader, go through the book of First Enoch and he offers some assistance in understanding the book of First Enoch. But Tertullian thought it should be in the canon, fought for it, but at the end of his life figured that if the Holy Spirit did not lead the entire church to accept it, that maybe it should not be in the canon. But his earlier ideas was it should be because he saw so much of it and there are traditions within Christianity that have first Enoch in their Bibles of which um, Dr. Heiser is clear to argue that he does not believe that first Enoch has to be in our Bibles but the point of this is that there was grand discussion for centuries over what should be included in our and then even the order and how the book. Now again, the Masoretic text is only about 22 books, depending again. The letters of the alphabet, uh, there's like two S letters. So if you combine those two S letters to make one letter, then there's typically uh, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. If you look at Psalm 119, it has 22 sections based on those 22 letters of the alphabet where each psalm is focused on one individual, highlighting one individual grammatically in the grammar, in the poetry, is highlighting one, each one of those letters. And so it has 22 uh, sections, and it's all highlighting beautiful poetry in Psalm 119 of those 22 letters. Okay, and therefore, some have reduced the Old Testament canon to match with 22 books of the Bible, combining many books like Ezra and Nehemiah, like the Book of the Twelve, and different ones to make one book scroll, one volume, and their library of the old, what we call the Old Testament, their Hebrew Bible, is consisting of these 22, but in a different order, okay, in a different order. And then there's, there's arguments over what came first, and there's portions of Deuteronomy, like the Song of Moses, is believed to be some of the oldest scriptures that we have, where there's other parts of the book of Deuteronomy and definitely uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis that scholars argue that come much later 
written, compiled, brought together later uh, at a different time. So, did Moses write those? There's all kinds of questions. And then we get back to the Trinity, of course. The word Trinity is not in our Bible. And that discussion did not end at the same time as the canon discussion. It went on, and it goes on, and we mentioned the Chalcedonian uh, uh, ideas in a previous video from the Council of Chalcedon. And so it, it goes on, okay? And so the church has discussed these things. So in the first area of Wesley's quadrilateral is scripture, and there are some who believe only in the scripture, but then what is the scripture? Who decided which books get in and which get out? There's no one in Christian tradition that went up to a mountain like Sinai, as Moses did, and came down, as Joseph Smith is famous for producing his Bible, saying that this came from the angel Moroni. There's no one in Christian tradition that went, uh, ascended to heaven, and came down to us and said, this is the Bible. As I discussed briefly uh, with Tertullian, it was the tradition, the church. So, Tradition within the confines of the church's larger discussion. Tradition within the confines of the church's larger discussion. Okay. It was the church communally. So the idea is tradition allows us that the church is the authority. Now, what Gilbert argues is that we cannot trust tradition because tradition is men. And men make wrong decisions. And again, the reason why we're here is because Gilbert has one view and McKnight and Bates have another, and who's right? If we're talking about sola scriptura, only scriptures, well, we again go back to what is scripture. For Paul, if he wrote this, and I'm not going to get in those debates, but let's say Paul wrote it, all scripture, okay, all scripture. At this time, was Matthew written, Mark, Luke, John? The Gospel of John is believed to be one of the last books written by some. Was John written yet? And did Moses start writing in the beginning? If we, if again, if we were going to ignore Heiser's academics, scholarship, and we're going to say that Moses wrote all of the Pentateuch, if we if we take even that view, okay, did Moses sit down and he start out in the beginning? What did he write first? Where did Moses let his pen down? So what's first? You know, again, scholars are divided. The historical Jesus, uh, who wrote first, and most scholars are content to say that Mark's gospel is probably the first one. But then scholars also say that, what? Paul, in his letter to Thessalonica, possible First Thessalonians, is some of the first, first writings that we have. That this letter that Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica is perhaps the first of the New Testament to be written down by our understanding. So, what Wesley's trying to say is that we have these four things, and what Gilbert is trying to do is, is knock out the last three, and he wants a sola scriptura. Okay? So then we have what Gilbert believes. Excuse me, Gilbert wants to knock out Wesley's tradition, reason, experience, and he wants to deal with only scripture. Although you can see from the Wesley quote what Wesley taught is very similar to what Greg Gilbert said, but he allowed for tradition, he allowed for reason he allowed for experience tradition because tradition is what they decided masoretic tradition decided which books of the old testament went into the old testament what christians called the old testament in their hebrew bible it was the tradition that decided it was tradition that passed down and saved it was tradition as i often describe it to my students if they had facebook back in the day 
We had so many Gospels out there. Not just the four, we had so many. But if there was Facebook in the first century, it was these four that were shared first and foremost and had the widest reception. So it was the tradition. It was the church that chose these four. Okay, it was the church that chose these four. And even the, the uh, common argumentation where he brings all these four together and makes one gospel. He uses these and he does not use the gospel of Thomas. And most of the other gospels came later. But there is some question about the gospel of Thomas. Why is it not in our Bible? It may have some bearing as far as it being closer to the time of the other four gospels and its origin when it was written. But then there's other reasons why scholars do not accept it as a part of our um, Bible. And so what you have is tradition and reason. You have tradition, the church. They base their decisions upon what the larger body so that not one person had control of the dialogue. Not one human who could be mistaken. But it was the entire church coming together in one accord like in the book of Acts. Following the Holy Spirit. And Tertullian is willing to say, okay, no on the first Enoch. Because Obviously, the Holy Spirit isn't speaking that same truth to the rest of the body of Christ. Therefore, I must be wrong. And I'm willing to be wrong because I believe more strongly in the Holy Spirit. So it was his experience, Tertullian's experience with the Holy Spirit and the church. It was through tradition, using his reason, using the scholarship of his day to say, okay, first Enoch. Maybe it doesn't belong in our Bible. Okay? And it was tradition, and it was reason, and it was experience that told us that the Gospel of Thomas does not belong in our Bible. And some people are questioning that today. And even some of the other Gospels, you know, the Gospel of Philip, where Jesus uh, is understood to have kissed Mary Magdalene and the whole Da Vinci uh, deception of the Da Vinci Code and all these things that have come up. For those of you who are in uh, historical Jesus or apologetics, you can get into all that. Okay. So, to say sola scriptura, we can't. Because again, everyone has their own private interpretation of what the Bible means. Okay. Luther had his interpretation. Okay. Melanchthon has his. Calvin has his. Everyone has their own private interpretation. So, how do you get away from private interpretation? You do what Tertullian does. You use, as Wesley describes, tradition, reason, and experience. Tradition. How does the rest of the body of Christ, how does the rest of the church understand this so that I'm not the only one, the only voice? And so Tertullian is like, I apparently am one of the few who believe in First Enoch. I'm going to let it go because the rest of the church doesn't accept it. Okay? Then you have the whole idea of academics. And the tradition is what the church has said. In the last, of course, the church is 2,000 years old. So what the church has said, what the church has understood in their councils. And they hold these ecumenical councils where they bring leaders from every aspect as much as possible. The vast majority, they open it up for the vast majority of the church to come together and make a decision and discuss everything and then using reason and experience in the room the church then makes a decision and we go with the majority and so we don't end up with uh, a canon like Markian and he was the first one if you study Markian he was the first one who believed there was a God of the Old Testament and a different God the God of the New Testament two different gods and so he's the one that began to establish a different canon of what the Bible is. What is the Bible? So we're doing a, a study on what is the gospel. You could do another whole series and study on what is the Bible. Okay. And so for Markian, he did not agree. So he took Paul as his focus, like most reform do. Then he decided that there was a lot of the four gospels that don't line up with Paul's teaching. So he cut them out. And he primarily focused on the Gospel of Luke, but he didn't accept all of Luke. He cut Luke out because it didn't fit with Paul. 
So he took the parts of Luke that he liked. He didn't like the Old Testament. He kicked that out. You know, he just started cutting and chopping. And so the church had to step in and say, wait a minute. Okay, we need to develop a canon here because here's one guy that's influencing a lot of people. And he's telling a lot of people that all these books in the Old Testament and all these books in the New Testament, they don't belong to part of the Bible. And so the church was forced to, because of Markian, to begin discussions. And it took time. It took many years and they had discussions and over that time they came to consensus where they all surrendered to the holy spirit believed that they were led by god and came together to agreement so that we have the 27 books of the new testament as we have them you get into the whole discussion of the book of hebrews and what it is who wrote it did paul write it who wrote it and how it got into the canon how it made it into the 27 and the whole the, the book of revelation you know all these different books how they got in the 27 it was because the church through its tradition applied reason and experience and came up with this understanding okay so wesley is just taking what he understands has happened in the last 2000 years and try to apply it so within the confines of the church's larger discussion what they felt like what they believed and what where again totally to i'm wrong about first enoch but then there's again churches traditions today in africa that have the first enoch in their bible okay but i'm willing to let it go because the larger church community does not hear the same thing from the Holy Spirit. So it's not my private interpretation. Okay. So I'm going to submit to the tradition and say, okay, it must not belong. Then again, you have academics as an example of reason to ensure that it's logically understood. You know, we talk about Lagos in John chapter one. Paul talks about Lagos in Romans 12:1. Okay, Romans 1, 12, 1 and 2. Okay, so it needs to be logical. And so we talk about that. And so scholars have a debate. So there's, within tradition, the church has discussion. Okay, and they bounce ideas off of each other. And they work through things where heresy is other thinking. And then orthodoxy is same thinking. And what is orthodox is what the majority, and the vast majority, and don't get the Da Vinci Code and some of these, uh, Dan Brown, some of these discussions of modern atheists who are way off, uh, lead you to believe that, that they voted on these things and the vote was very close. No, Markian and one of his comrades disagreed on certain language, you know, so that's why two dissenting votes out of hundreds, uh, just disagreed with maybe one Greek or two Greek words in a document and could not agree to vote on that. Okay, so it's two people out of hundreds. You can go do the research yourself. You can study it out. But you have this discussion within the church. Then you have the discussion within academics, academia, using reasoning. And people present papers and say, I think you're wrong here. So let's look again at uh, 2 Timothy. Okay, 2 Timothy, right? All right. A man has presented papers and written works on 2 Timothy. And for a long time, people have considered 2 Timothy to be Paul's last letter. And it's his dying will type letter that he's dying. And it's his death. And scholars have gone with that estimation from tradition this is what tradition teaches us and this is what scholars have long stood for and yet today there are scholars who argue no this does not fit when we look at how a greco-roman person in the time period of paul would write their last will and testament and how they would write their last work as they were dying and what they would say paul is not doing that it doesn't fit grammatically. It doesn't fit the historical context. It doesn't fit anything. And so when we look at a book like Second Timothy and then academics 
So this man presents a paper that this is something else is going on in Second Timothy, that Second Timothy is not necessarily written as late as we think it is at the end of Paul's life because of some of the statements he makes. Rather, Second Timothy fits this profile, and he has written a paper to argue against that, and that tradition and former reason needs to reconsider based on a new look at the grammar and the historical context of Paul to see Second Timothy is written much earlier, and he gives stronger evidence that Paul himself is behind Second Timothy, and Paul is not writing his last letter dying as an old man, turning everything over to Timothy, that Paul is doing something else. Okay? So that we have these examples. Okay? And for more information on that, you can go to the Naked Bible Podcast, where Dr. Heiser uh, does, uh, does an interview uh, on Second Timothy with another scholar and discusses that. Okay, so where tradition and reason have failed. Again, experience practical application is something we brought up in our last meeting together. Um, how does one apply the gospel to practical application? What is our experience with it? Okay, so Greg Gilbert is going to um, delete all these things and say sola scriptura. But then what is scripture? It took, scripture is merely the collection of writings passed down through tradition, through the church, through scholarship, through scribes. And it is the embodiment of the experience of God's people. You know, Moses' experience in the wilderness. And then Paul can write about that in 1 Corinthians 10. Okay? So then Paul's writing about Moses' experience in 1 Corinthians 10 becomes 1 Corinthians 10. Okay? And we didn't even know it was chapter 10, that these things come later. Someone began to use that when the Bible was being uh, used in a printing press. And there was a document passing around a few decades ago that was supposed to be the Gospel of John. It's supposed to be a very early copy of the Gospel of John. And it was all talked about in the church. Oh, look, we have this document from the Gospel of John. It's so early. And yet, scholars laughed at the church. Because the church thought, oh, we have this Gospel of John that's so early. They laughed because it had the chapter and verse numbers in it. <laughs> Which just are less than a thousand years old that were added by man. So for us to be able to say 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, those are added things to the scripture by man. So back to what I said when I pastored that church for many years in that denomination where they believe that, yes, we believe that the Bible is God's word. But as soon as the human gets involved, and me as a human, as soon as I begin to read the Bible, then I enter into it, then my mind automatically, at that point, my mind, then all of a sudden, enters into it, and then oh, it's corrupted, because now I'm a human, and I'm reading it, and I can have private interpretation. And so, the traditions in the church that focus on tradition are scared of the scriptures, alone sola scripture because you can take the bible and you can read it one way and the next person can read it another way and so automatically greg gilbert's argument falls apart because it was written by humans for humans okay and humans are involved in the process and so at any point humans mess it up and so Again, go back to what are the scriptures? And what is the gospel? Or what are the scriptures? Well, it took the tradition of the church to hammer that out over centuries and to decide together. Not private interpretation, Markian, this is the Bible. He's the one that started it because he decided that he wanted to say this is what the Bible is and the rest of these are not. That the church had to make a decision. 
And then by that time, there were many Gospels, more than four, more than five, the Gospel of Thomas, many more. And the church had to go through and sort it all out and decide which of the books would be in the New Testament, which would be in the Old Testament. And the church, again, is in disagreement today over which books belong in the Bible. And then even the Protestant Bible has a different order than the Hebrew Bible, such that one can translate or understand or interpret Ruth one way, because it's in with the book of Judges, or if they take what the Masoretes done, and Ruth is at the end of the Old Testament, it can be understood as this way. Okay? Simply by moving where it belongs in the canon. So I wanted to help you understand that Gilbert is boiling this down, making it so simple, and it's so simple to say, okay, well, we just have the Bible, and we just trust with the Bible. But when you are trusting the Bible, you are trusting the tradition and the reasoning, the academics, and the experience of others who have gone before you, because the Bible is tradition that the church, that the believers of Yahweh have passed down to us using reason, using scholarship, using scribes, okay? And it is telling the story of their experience. And so the Holy Spirit, Wesley understood, uses all these. And yes, there's some experience outside of truth. There's some reason outside of truth. There's some tradition outside of truth. There's some truth outside the Bible. There is. There's some truth that's outside the Bible. Not all truth is contained in the scripture. So hopefully from this slide, you can understand. And for Gilbert just to make a blanket statement, sola scripture. But who decided? Because God did not just send us an email, a text message, and say, these are the books of the Bible I want. Okay, we don't have a record where God decided this was God's word. What happened was, is tradition preserved these things. And then tradition passed it down to us. And academics has played a large role, reason, and experience. You know, that's what tradition went by, experience. The experience is that these are the books of the New Testament that we have seen all Christians have each experienced the majority, the vast majority of Christendom through their experience have elevated these books and these others they have not. These others, like First Enoch, does not have widespread acceptance among the church in their experience. Therefore, to tell you upon later in his life, upon his understanding that I'm about ready to die, said then, obviously, I guess, first you know, it does not belong in the scriptures. And Heiser's okay with that. Heiser does a wonderful job of explaining why we need to read the Pseudepigrapha and the Apocrypha. And again, David De Silva's done a lot of work in the Apocrypha, and he's going to work on the Pseudepigrapha, okay, to, to try to say why we need to do this. Okay, so why we need to read these books. They are significant, they are important, but they are not God's word for us. But for some people, they are. So it's easy just to say in a real short line, because Gilbert's got a lot to discuss, but it's easy just to brush this aside. A discussion that has taken thousands of years to deal with. Hundreds of years for the canon. It took hundreds of years because Markian. So study it out. Go through and do a study of the canon. And why we have these 66 books. Okay. Study it out. And how we got the scriptures. Okay. And then study out the Trinity. And the discussions are still ongoing. And again, it's, it's great that Dan Brown comes along and puts doubt so is doubt in so many people's minds. Okay. It's, it's great. Because that doubt that some causes Christians to go back 
and look at their roots and dig down deeper and get stronger into what they actually believe. Okay, so I thought this was very important to cover on the onset because Gilbert just brushes it aside in 30 seconds of reading as if, oh yeah, so it was scripture. Okay, but really, Solo scripture leads to private interpretation, which leads to lots of problems. Therefore, the church looks to how has the church understood these things together corporately in the last 2,000 years. And scholarship then applies how does it work in their field to apply reason. And then we apply experience. And so... I think that I did a feeble attempt here, but hopefully I've done a decent job to explain this to you so that you can understand what's going on in a broader sense. And it's not as easy as Greg Gilbert wants to make it out to be. So what I can understand is how Gilbert can so easily divorce Scripture from tra tradition, reason, and experience. When Wesley... Uh, obviously understood there's no way we can do that because scripture comes from tradition Tr scripture is tradition it's the sacred tradition of our belief system yeah, the old testament as we call it is the sacred tradition of the jews saved for us so how can you divorce scripture from tradition when scripture is tradition it's what the believers saved in their community and how can you uh, again delete reason and you're going to blame tradition reason and experience as human but scripture is not human and you don't understand the incarnation and when God became man and the word became flesh so uh, it's impossible to understand <laughs> the scriptures apart from humans because humans are intricately involved and you cannot just make a blanket statement it is impossible for Gilbert to it's just impossible for him to make this dichotomy you cannot make this distinction because ultimately it was humans who heard from God who decided what was scriptures and it was humans who heard from God who wrote the scriptures God didn't write them himself. And the Holy Spirit was involved. And it's a team effort. It's not just Ronaldo and Messi on the field doing everything. It's a team effort. Okay? That God used multiple people to bring about this. Multiple people to bring about it. Whether Jeremiah wrote portions of Jeremiah or not, or whether Baruch wrote them or not, God used it more than just Jeremiah to give us the book of Jeremiah okay it's, it's just quite obvious and so uh, to delete reason to delete tradition delete experience and just say oh because it's human well then you have to delete scripture okay it's just totally illogical what Gilbert's trying to do it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and I understand what's going on here, and it's along the lines of what we discussed before in the last category of experience and practical application. Um, what Gilbert's trying to do is boil down the gospel to essential core, and what we're trying to boil down is, is trying to get as much human influence out of the Bible as possible, and so we're trying to simplify and explain it to somebody in 30 seconds, and to do that we just say sola scripture. I understand what he's trying to do there. But it's just more intricate, and it's just, it's not possible to delete the human element from the Bible. It's not, because the human element is so large in the Bible. And therefore, because the human element is in the Bible, we need tradition, reason, and experience to help us. Because any human approaching the Bible is going to make mistakes. Private interpretation. Therefore, we need tradition, reason, and experience to help us. To avoid those mistakes at the same time it was produced by humans okay God chose to use humans it is he just didn't send it directly from heaven but we have to understand that even 
in what Gilbert's trying to do. He's using the experience category. In his experience, this is the easiest way to explain this. Because he's trying to avoid so many mistakes. You know, and that's what Heiser, his fundamental uh, idea is. That most scholars tell Dr. Heiser, you're wasting your time bringing scholarship to the masses because they won't get it right. And it's almost the same thing that the Catholic Church taught because of this fear of private interpretation. Only qualified people can read the scriptures and only qualified people can then tell us what the scriptures mean. Okay, so what Heiser is trying to do is in reason and scholarship is trying to bring it down to the common layperson so they can understand it. And there's a danger in that, that they'll misunderstand, they'll abuse it and take it the wrong way, and they have. And the same thing with the church, the Catholic church, in their traditions, in the higher church experience. Only qualified people can rightly divide the word of truth, so they handle it because they will check and make sure that what they are doing is not private interpretation. Okay? And so, again, there's your problem. So, within the church, we have tradition to protect us from private interpretation. Within academics, we have critiques of someone like Gilbert and saying, Gilbert, I think you got it wrong, so that we can make sure that we're not just listening to Gilbert. How do we know that when Gilbert says Sola Scriptura, that Gilbert's not wrong? How do we know? Because he's human, and he tells us Sola Scriptura. Okay? And we can go through the other four Solas. And you know the argument that I use from David De Silva, that the only time the word Sola Fide appears together, those two words appear in the entire New Testament, <laughs> is not what the reformers say it is. You know, and again, go back to my body justice paper where I, where I quote that. Okay? So, faith alone, without works, is dead. So we need tradition, reason, and experience to protect us. Because one person can be wrong, but if the church as a whole and if scholars as a whole and our experience together as common lay people, the practical on the ground as a whole, if three, three areas can help us with scripture and truth, we are far less likely to make huge mistakes. And that's what Wesley is arguing. And that's what Gilbert ceases to understand. And he wants to make it more simple. And yet, he at the same time is making more mistakes. Once we reduce the gospel to sola something and individualize it, then this private interpretation becomes problematic. It's when we're held accountable by all of scripture, not just our favorite verses. Pick and choose what we want. Gilbert is picking and choosing one of these over the other, making it simple. He's picking and choosing certain Bible verses that fit his private interpretation, ignoring the other verses that don't fit so well in his private interpretation. It's when we have to submit our ideas to the entirety of Scripture, when we have to submit our ideas to the entirety of the church tradition, how does it stand up to what the church has believed, when we have to submit our ideas to scholarship and reason? How does it stand up to those who have spent their life invested in these things? Do we have a logical reason to assume that this person is wrong because they thought in a way that led them to a fallacy? Do we have reason behind that? Can we argue that yes, they made a mistake here? There's reasons why I'm glad you did this, but I think you're wrong because I have these reasons that make logical sense and then our experience, our experience tells us. And Tertullian, his experience was that no one was accepting First Enoch. Therefore, it's just 
I'm going to have to drop it. Okay. So, back to Gilbert. He's entirely individualistic. And he doesn't have to be held accountable by anybody. Nobody in the church can tell him he's wrong. Nobody in scholarship can tell him wrong. And he can do what he wants to. And that's dangerous. We need to be held accountable to each other. We need to be held accountable to the entirety of God's word, to the entirety of scripture, to the entirety of what's reasonable. And we need to see how that fits in practically with our experience and how we actually can make it real. Does it really work? It sounds great on paper, but does it really work in the practical world?